There we go. Yep. So yeah, let's start with checking. Yeah, cool. Uh, so the you know about the new version of Holochain, the RSM version, as opposed mm -hmm. to the current Redux yep. version. Yep. Right. So uh, I'll be transitioning to the RSM version with CRISPR um, probably tomorrow. What? And I <clears throat> packaged up a version of CRISPR that works with the Redux version. And it's a lot simpler than what I've been showing you. I'll cut it right back to uh, CRISPR. Hmm. And yeah, so that's what works. So I'm doing some videos on that today on how it all works. So there is a Holonix command. You just go, what is it, HC HAPS CRISPR. Hmm. And that will pull everything down for you and run it. And then there's some steps on how to set up Holochain for you. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, so in CRISPR now you can write, package and install the DNA that you're building uh, into, into your running instance, which helps you be able to um, edit the actual UI for it. So you can like build the DNA, publish that, and then modify your UI to, to work with it immediately. Um, what else is happening? So yeah, so the new RSM version, it's, I'm, not refactoring the one I've got, I'm going to start again and port things over as I need them. And I don't know if you guys have seen Blockly, it's in the Google Blockly programming language. Uh, oops, can, I share, can, I, yeah, can I share? No. Can I have a share oh, screen for a sec? There you go. Ah. Yeah, if you look at this. Um, <clears throat> So Blockly is a programming language that you can program the blocks. So if you oh. look at something like code editor, you literally uh, give people this kind of functionality so they can do a, a loop, you know, so here's the loop, you know, mm. repeat 10 times to do this thing. We can do other things in there as well. We could uh, we can do all sorts of stuff. Mm. Um, and then it dumps out in place JavaScript, Python, et cetera. But I've actually been working on one that dumps out Rust. And so I'm going to have a DNA editor like this. So you have, what I'll do is I'll use the, I'll like generate you a bunch of code, which is Blockly uh, blocks, which you can then, you know, tweak if you want. So then there's a lot more control over the, your uh, DHT or your DNA. <clears throat> and yeah, so it'll be on the RSM version next week. Uh, I spoke to David Meister a couple of days ago and we went through the existing HDK. There is enough there now to do pretty much everything I've been building with uh, the Redux version. And um, yeah, he's built the uh, built anchors into the RSM version. So some of these things that we were using externally are now uh, like fundamental parts of the whole chain, which is nice. Um, and the anchors thing, instead of just having two layers, you can now, it's basically a path. So you can anchor your things as deep as you want, which is really neat. And that's about it. Yeah, so I'm gonna do a bunch of videos today on how all the existing stuff works. And publish those. Are you muted, Sid? That is really cool, I said, and looking forward to downloading it and playing with it and installing it finally. Um, the, you said <clears> you're <throat> going to start work on the RSM um, version of it tomorrow? Yeah, as soon as I finish the videos, then I'm, I'm not touching this version again. Very cool. So it's not complete and doesn't do everything that you want it to mm. do, but it, like, it's, a, it's a really intense learning experience for me and I've built something really fun. So that is awesome. Next, yeah. And something about Blockly for Rust really gets me excited. Yeah. So it's actually not that difficult to do. So there's a block factory. So you can go to the Google thing and create your own blocks. Oh. I did one for validate agent. Um, <clears throat> validate agent block on your thing and then it generates the code for you. 
Um, <clears throat> so yeah, is, so uh, I really got into the Blockly thing because uh, lots of people are using it for, um, yeah, like being able to program, but without having to know all the syntax and all the mm. nuances. I just want logic stuff. So it's basically just. Um, yeah, and especially Rust, right? Like syntax is just awful. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so this way, you know, you kind of give people, it's kind of that next level from point and shoot to point, shoot and tweak. And mm. then if you want more control, you have to go and write your own stuff. Mm. Very cool. Have you seen um, a fast 50 version of Holochain is? No, I've only heard stories. Yeah, it's significantly uh, faster. Yeah. Yeah, I can't wait. Um, yeah. Let's continue with quick chickens. Philip, when do you nominate someone? Um, uh, Michael Hushin. Michael. Yeah, and let's keep them brief because we can get to Sam's project then. So maybe just 20 seconds or 30 seconds. Thanks. Cool. Um, yeah, so let's see. Recently, I have been continuing to learn Rust. Um, I was doing a little uh, command line app of my own. Uh, it's kind of my first deep dive into Rust. And then I've been going through the Holochain tutorials. And this is all aiming for me to get up to speed to contribute to Holo REA. Um, so that's going well. It's fun. It's coming. Yeah, like. I have this Haskell background, and so it's cool to see how Rust kind of draws on some of that or kind of relates to some of that. And yeah, mostly learning. I just joined the dev camp, so that's exciting. And yeah, lots of learning, some things to show for it, and building momentum. So yeah, that's me. Yeah. And nominate someone. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's go Sam Waterhouse. Thanks, Michael. Uh, hi, everyone. Morning. Um, so I've uh, pretty much finished up on the platform co-ops now course, which is a sort of incubator for platform co-ops internationally. And there's been groups all around the world doing the same course, uh, but we broke off into Australian group. And now we just have to do the pitch, uh, which will be a lot of fun for me because um, I don't really like that stuff. But, you know, that's a challenge. Um, uh, and that happens next Tuesday. I guess I could share the pitch because it's, it's for Loconomics, so it'll be relevant um, uh, if people are interested. Uh, I'll share the pitch on the Loconomics um, thing on, what was it, 100 apps? Yeah. Mm. And that'll be last week. So that's where I'm at. And uh, yeah, I'm doing a demo today for you guys to show you what Loconomics can do. Uh, but we'll get to that in a minute. Cool, and next person. Yeah, uh, Greg. Hey, thanks, man. Um, so there's a Simpsons where Homer gets a gun and he tries to use it on everything, to change the channel on the TV, turn the lights off. And I'm just took, I've taken the currency design course and now I'm looking at currencies to solve everything. So that's how the, you know, everything, and I think it's good, right? I wanna go through this process of trying to use the system and get on the vocabulary as everybody else. So it's, it's been really fun and, and um, mind opening to go through those courses. Next person. Greg, do you wanna nominate someone? Sorry, possibly, go ahead, man. Hey. Uh... Yeah, it's been a pretty chill week. I haven't, it's been mostly like strategic things and not a lot of coding. Uh, helped to assemble a shed. It's, you know, it's all been pretty chill. Uh, and just kind of been slowly plugging away around the edges of this marketplace app that needs to be built otherwise. Um, but yeah, happy to be here. And uh, Armando, shall we hear from you? Please? All right. Um... Not much really going on with me this week, I guess. Um, I've just like checked in, see what there was for me to help with in Sacred Capital. Aside from that, um, heading back to the US, so packing things up mostly. Yeah. Um, Aribata? Uh, 
<clears throat> uh, happy to be here. I resonate with what uh, Greg mentioned. The, the future of currency workshop is making me also do the same thing. So it's, it's fun and uh, liking it. And uh, happy to be here. Actually, in the morning hackalong, that sets that uh, sets the uh, kind of a vibe for the community uh, by saying, "I love you. I love you all. I love to be here. I like it. So it's nice. Thank you." And uh, next person, uh, Sid. How about you? Thanks. I've also had a bit of a strategic week, um, just putting together designs for neighborhoods and re the reputation vault. And so a lot of conversations, a lot of thinking, a lot of like bringing pieces together, um, which is nice as an entrepreneur. It's also frustrating, um, but yeah, that's been, that's been fun. Apart from that, also um, helping out with dev camp. So it's been good to see some of the entrepreneurs coming in. Um, that does give me hope something like 200 people signed up again. So I, I don't know how many people are actually in there, but um, it felt like some good developers, some good people who will start building things on Hologen. Um, I see. Just a quick yeah. question about the um, dev camp stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, we could catch up uh, early next week and have a chat about like your experiences of having done that a few times now mm -hmm. and maybe we can incorporate some of that into the next version of oh. Casper. Yeah, that would be cool. Let's chat. Yeah. Um, and I nominate Feli. Hey, I'm doing pretty good. Just eating dinner right here with my camera off. And um, sorry, my dog here. Get you one here. It's Harry. Um, yeah, I've been good. I've just been really diving into Bayesian statistics and modeling and um, trying to see what mathematical tools and uh, statistical tools can be brought to like operations and logistics and just like dealing with uncertainty and using inference to make decisions based on that. And so you know, like the, the known knowns, the known unknowns, the unknown unknowns and all those and seeing and I'm learning about how to implement that in, in code with uh, mainly with TensorFlow probability and just trying to see uh, where that can lead to. Unfortunately, there's no Rust version of TensorFlow, but uh, they, they, they might, there might be some overlap down the road. So that's where I'm at. Nice. And I guess that leaves Lynn. Hi, everybody. Um, end of the day for us here been a long one on on my way down basically here but uh interested in hearing uh sam talk about localonomics so uh good to see everybody and uh, looking forward to it thank you thanks lynn should we get right into it so we're featuring sam's project localonomics today and sam you can go first share a brief like a little bit about localonomics if you have any anything to share on the screen, feel free to go ahead. And then we could try and dissect it or try and map it onto an agent-centric paradigm, maybe even see how Hollow REA plays a role, how CRISPR could potentially play a role, how reputation systems could play a role, and if there's any other um, layers of Hollow Chain that we want to bring into this. Um, we have about 45 minutes, but I think we'll go over, so maybe about 55 minutes for exploring this. So yeah, over to you, Sam. Right, thanks. Uh, so if you don't know much about low economics, I'll give you a quick uh, background. Um, it's a platform co-op that started in the United States. Um, so it's for gig workers to promote themselves, freelancers, you know, people in your local community to uh, to find you and for you to be able to book people and and uh, stuff like that. So they started in the States and they open sourced it um, and they're a platform co-op as well. And uh, so I've basically just taken the source code of stuff that was written by a guy called Iago from Spain. And uh, so it's quite an international effort and uh, could basically converted it to Australia. So instead of um, zip codes, it now has postcodes and all that kind of stuff. 
uh, at the moment we are not for profit in um, Melbourne um, focusing on the area that we live in because that makes most sense so that's Darabin in the northern suburbs of Melbourne uh, we are looking for members and founders uh, to kick off the, the sort of cooperative aspects of it so to define the rules that make sense for people in in Darabin um, and and uh, yeah, so a lot of the rules that are currently written for it, which is very thorough, and there's a lot of information there, but it's all based on US law, so um, um, a lot of it is not relevant to us. So that's what we need to do. Um, yes, yeah, so if I can share this is my screen. Should be able to. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just show you the current website. There's a few uh, bugs in it, so we won't be able to go through a whole end-to-end -end, um, booking process, but you'll get the general idea once I've done you know, showing you some of the key screens. Uh, so this is where you end up when you first log in, and you can register either as a service provider or as a client. And if you're a service provider, you can add uh, the services that you provide, um, what what times you're available and uh, stuff and your prices. So if you're looking, for example, if I come in here, let me go. I'm actually logged in as a service provider in this screen. So if I can go over to uh, here, this is me logged in as a client. So if I'm looking for someone in Northcote and I go and I want some self care. So there's a whole bunch of different categories of um, things that you want done from home care and all of these. So each one of these categories is about, well, this is a large one, there's about 40 different categories of jobs. Um, service providers, service providers can add their own jobs, uh, which have to be approved, obviously, because there's some jobs you might not want on the platform, depending on what you're aiming at, but uh, so if I say I want to look for a massage therapist and this is the massage therapy service which is provided by the other user I've got here. Uh, so I can see that's that massage therapy job. There's a bug here, you'll see, hopefully, I need to fix. Boom. I'll be fixed one day. Um, so, come in here, you go request a serve, uh, request an appointment. You can see this offerings that I provide, which are customizable on this page. You can edit those, hopefully. Yeah, so these are all editable. There should be a calendar somewhere. And your booking, these are the hours. You can also, one of the things I need to fix up, but basically what's interesting is you can add, um, you can add, Scroll down credentials and verifications. So this might be interesting for you, Sid. That you can say, I've got these professional licenses, I've got education credentials, and then this digital badges works using something called Badger. So it's like a linking between um, what you say you can do and what you, where your actual credential comes from. So you basically link on this site your um, credential, which might be with an approved student you know, massage um, um, organization in your state. Uh, and then this gives you a um, API that you can then add that badge to your profile. Um, can't, can't demo that at the moment, but you can imagine that would be useful for um, 
uh, proving you can do what you say you can do without just adding a whole bunch of links on your profile, which would be pretty cool. Uh, so um, when you're uh, looking at the wrong ones, yeah. Um, so I want to schedule myself, get myself a massage if that was possible. That'd be nice. Um, save and continue. That or you're legally allowed to do it. That is what I'm saying. What's that? That or you're legally allowed to do it at the moment. Yourself a massage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have to self isolate for myself. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so say if you go through these steps. So you select the offering, select the location where you want to do it. So you'd probably do it like there's, there's options that the service provider can do. They're either providing the service in an area and they come to you or they're providing a service at a location and you come to them. So that's configured by the service provider uh, when they create the service. Um, so here I'm the client and I'm saying you have to come to me um, preferred times is you can select the times that you want them to come. Currently, it's you select three times. And Sam, on the address and stuff, yeah. as you've noticed, porting it from another country, addresses and dates are a nightmare. Um, have yeah. you looked at, you? there's like a, I think it's Google Maps has a service for doing addresses and it's super cool. Like you just literally start typing in your address because it's figured out where you are. It, like, yeah, this does that. Oh, does it? Did do it. Well, it does it with the postcode. So if I was typing, yeah, three zero seven zero Northcote, it realizes that's in Northcote. So yeah, stuff like that is working. I'm not sure why it's not working on this screen, but yeah, we've got that in there. Uh, so you select the preferred times, which is a bit of a pain, but that's what it is. So all of this stuff that you're seeing uh, comes with the open source software. So the only bits I've really modified are uh, making sure the data is, is Australian based. So um, the bit that will stop us going any further, unfortunately, is the payment because um, you'll see an error in a minute. It's using Braintree payment provider, which is not configured because um, I want to use a different one. So I need to either turn that off or work with another provider to get that working. So basically, here's a summary. Once you hit submit on this, if it didn't error, it would uh, send an email and create, and then the service provider has to um, confirm the booking. And then, so a lot of what the code does is, all, is managing the uh, sort of transaction or the booking process between the service provider and the client. So imagine if that did work, then you'd come through to the your, um, calendar. The service provider would get an email and then stuff, and, and they would approve it. And then they would be able to, um, client would then appear in their list of clients. So I've added some clients here that you can then manage in a very basic way. Um, for, for like um, recurring work. So that is kind of it, it in a nutshell. Um, you can see the different listings that you can add. So if I want to add a new listing, I search for a job, which could be anything, dog walker. So now it's telling me. Do you have restrictions on what um, be? what could be registered as a, as a service? Yeah, so the things that come up in the list, so if I do that again, you can see that it was auto completing, dog, whatever. So that's all the, the, um, the jobs that you can do that's in the list that appears on the homepage that I showed you right at the beginning. But you can add anything you want, like uh, being amazing. You're the first, so you can create that. So I can be the first person at being amazing, which is you know, obviously a good thing. Um, 
Yeah, but those need to be approved. So like I said, you probably don't want uh, certain services appearing on the site. Um, obviously people would create lots of dodgy ones or they'd create ones that already exist, but a name slightly differently. So, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and then you'd see your bookings, if I could make an, a, a booking or an appointment, um, the inboxing thing is here. So all these emails get sent and I'm assuming Holo wouldn't really use emails because you've got the whole CRISPR with notifications and all that kind of thing. Not really sure, but a lot of this is based off of emails. But obviously that messaging thing would just happen in a different way. <laughs> um, so the earnings, you just see what you've earned. Um, I imagine at some point it would integrate with something that, done, that handles um, invoicing, uh, zero or something like that. Um, that would be really cool. Uh, here's your profile where you can upload all your information, account is where you set your payment stuff, um, privacy, community is uh, what we need to sort of start building out as well because obviously um, one of the issues with the gig economy at the moment is that the platforms actively discourage the members from building any kind of community at all because they don't want them organizing and deciding actually this is this sucks <laughs> let's do something better but um, as a co-op we, we don't need we actively want the community so uh, one of the things this was using a different platform um, for their for their community, something called Mighty Networks. Um, but there may be other tools, which is open for debate. Uh, there may be other tools in um, Holochain where a community can be used for by these uh, um, service professionals. So clients that need help. This is where um, you can post a project. So this, I haven't really reviewed this much, but it looks like you post a project, something you need to get done, then a service provider can come here and see where what category matches the, so this service provider does um, dog walking and um, massage. There have been projects posted about dog walking and, and uh, massage that then appear in my list of things that need done. This is a little bit, so I don't know if you've seen other gig economy, gig platforms. They always focus on um, the jobs that need doing. So as a service provider, you log in and you see all the jobs and then you have to bid on those jobs, which is obviously not a great model if you want to have um, uh, people earning a fair wage. Uh, so this, so uh, but what we've got is we've got promoting the profiles of gig workers. So it kind of flips it on its head a little bit. Um, but there is the there's still the ability to create um, projects. And, to, and for uh, freelancers and gig workers to collaborate on those projects rather than individually having a bid on it. Um, ah, so reputations. So if I go back to here, let's quickly look. It's um, basically a star system for reputation. But I've got a lot of ideas on how that can be, how that can be uh, changed for something that really supports the, um, the workers, but I'll just show you what it currently does and I'll talk about the ideas I've got to improve it. So you've got the star system here. And I think I haven't done any stars, but I, I think once you've done a job, you can then um, review the, the member. Now, I, I actually prefer a model where um, the reputation is controlled by the, by the member so the part of a service provider so when someone gives you a review you can review the review and have it appear on your profile or not a bit like um linkedin how linkedin works but there's or then there's the issue of like how do you manage um members who actually aren't providing a good service or, or are abusing people 
So then you would have uh, service providers potentially having access to other service providers uh, reviews that weren't getting shown on the site. So almost like the, the service providers managing each other. And that would be useful if you get a bad review and then the, the community can potentially help you with why that was a bad review and find out what maybe what skills you're lacking to provide a good service and that sort of thing, rather than the current uh, platforms where they just talk about, I oh, know you get a bad review and you're off the platform and all of your reputation is gone. You might lose um, your status on the platform. So instead, so you go from gold to bronze straight away from depending on if you get a couple of bad reviews. Um, I really think that negative kind of um, interaction is a very good thing for, for you know, for the platform itself actually, or 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 for the people using it. I think maybe a, a more positive kind of like what help you need. How can you know these are the resources that we have available. These are how what how the platform can help. You. So um, I think that's that's it. Pretty briefly. Um, about talking about where we're going next. So maybe a bit of, I'll talk about that a little bit. So we are, um, we need to basically go through the whole site and test it a lot. So if anyone's got spare time, but I don't, I don't think many people do, but if you've got spare time to help out, we'll be really grateful to have people help test it. Um, we need to write more laws. So if you go to, yeah, we there all of this about stuff. So this is all about the current um, members and the current. So this is all the images still from who was involved in the United States. Uh, the foot is broken. And then there's all of the um, terms. Of so this, all of this stuff is based on American law and there's mm. tons of it. It's awesome what they've done, like they've got all of these rules about how to use the platform and how payments happen and all that kind of stuff. And HIPAA is an American thing, it's privacy, I think. Um, so all of that needs to be rewritten, but we're going to uh, engage with, because um, we're not for profit, uh, there's a group um, uh, called Justice Connect who hopefully will help us, um, they're based in Australia, so hopefully they'll help us um, get some pro bono work to get all of these documents. So privacy policy, background check policy, these are loads, loads to do. Um, and then there's the help documents. So um, unfortunately the help documents are lost from low economics when they stop trading in the state. Uh, so all of that has to be rewritten. So if I click here, there's no, no help. Um, and originally like there's like on every when you're doing each step there's like a section for help and that will, should be populated with all the all the information all the steps you need to do so that's quite a lot of work also so um we'll get there yeah we'll, get there. what we could focus today's session on is how holochain might add or shift things for economics. Um, and so we can open it up. So anyone who has reflections on how migrating this holo chain might, yeah, open new dimensions. Like from my perspective, I can see what's beautiful about going local is you don't know people just from one context. Like you can see them and interact with them from multiple contexts. So just straight off the bat, like I can see in agent centric environments, you could build it such that like I'm not looking at this massage therapist only in this on this platform, but you know their interactions, their commercial track record across you know years and different, and maybe even their own private economic transactions could be exposed here. So that's what excites me. But yeah, let's open it up. I don't know, possibly Philip, some of the others. Um, feel free to jump Just in. Just a really Lin, quick yeah. question. Yeah, quick question. Now, uh, what's the current Stack, ma'am. Technology-wise, yeah. 
Yep, it's using quite an old stack. It's using um, Knockout JS, which I just checked out on GitHub and hasn't been touched in two wow. to three years. Does anyone know Knockout? Do you mind if I stop sharing so I can see yep. people? Uh, yeah, that's better. So yeah, Knockout JS is pretty old. I mean, it's, <laughs> <yeah. laughs> so it's you know it needs to be rewritten, but then it doesn't most things. Uh, so yeah. Uh, and it's also using .NET Pages. I don't know if anyone's familiar with .NET, but basically Pages is a sort of like a really simplistic version of .NET a web websites. Um, and it's uh, that's 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 been depreciated by Microsoft as well. So there's a lot that needs to be updated, but at the moment um, it's work it's working well with a few bugs, but it, you know it does what it says it should do. So, yeah, so moving to Holochain would, would potentially be a um, good way of upgrading it to, to sort of more modern technology. Almost postmodern technology. <laughs> uh, like, is this uh, the cooperative currently exist? Does the cooperative currently exist? Like, are there members, are there people using service like this? Uh, not at the moment, no. So we're just registered and not for profit. Um, so we can get some benefits of, you know, like I said, Justice Connect and, and things like that. Because obviously we're not, we don't want to operate as the, the, the same kind of entity as uh, a task rabbit or anything like that. Um, so once we've found members and we've got uh, hopefully some funding in order to ho the host the thing, um, then we can um, transition to a to a platform co-op. There's a lot of questions still around how you how we gov you do governance of the of the platform co-op because you know if we start off in Darabin, that's fine. Um, Darabin members can manage that, but then how to if you then move to Sydney, how did uh, how do you just make decisions? I don't know if this is a really a hollow chain question, but it would be interesting to find out. How do you make decisions that are going to impact, you know, accountants in Sydney versus dog walkers in Darabin? It's going <laughs> to there's quite quite a, there's going to be a lot of um, Conflict and interests, I think. So do so. It come kind of comes back to how Holochain those uh, CRISPR things and how the communities can build their own components. You know, maybe they can just spawn a new application that works for accountants in Sydney. Yeah, can I just have a chat about that? That's exactly what's wrong with the entire of our current human existence is that we had this idea of laws, right? And a law that applies to me as a dog walker in Darabin. Uh, is probably not going to be of any relevance to an accountant in Sydney. Right? But because we have this hierarchical umbrella law, we're all subject to the same laws, even though they're completely irrelevant. Not unless you're a natural woman, yeah. a natural living woman, Philip, in, in Bunnings. <laughs> have you seen? <laughs> Sorry, it's probably a, uh, a local joke. But the virus has turned from a virus to an IQ test. It's really quite yeah. Awesome. Um, but yeah, I, when you, watching that demo of what you got there, that just reeks to me of let's rebuild this whole thing with CRISPR on top of REA from scratch. Yep. <clears throat> and do it agent centric because that you, you're right about the whole thing about if I have, you know, if I get kicked off Uber, I'm stuffed as a driver mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. and it couldn't, you know, and I don't know if that's someone else's agenda or something I legitimately need to be, but that really should be up to the decision of the passengers who are with the, not of some corporate entity. So um, I think it's a fascinating use case to incorporate pretty much everyone who's in this group to actually build something like that. Mm -hmm. I just yeah, I agree. So it sounds like we're saying that, yeah, sorry. I'll go for a boss B. No? Okay. 
yeah, it's um, it sounds to me like Loconomics is uh, wants to be you know a federated network of marketplaces more than one one platform for these reasons, um, because then you can have the the different rules and norms in the Sydney Nexus versus the Darabi Nexus and still have them talk to each other and have people to some degree be aware of the context when they're in each network. Um, yeah, yeah well, like so that's the same. Economy, really, it's supposed to be about the person, right? But it's not. It's basically you're a slave fighting for crap wages out of some dodgy platform where, you know, the guy that runs Task, what's it called? Air Tasker, sitting on his bloody Mediterranean yacht being a wanker, right? So this whole idea is really agent-centric because just because you're a good dog, dog worker in Darabin probably doesn't mean you're a good accountant in Sydney, right? So it's really, really localised to the person executing or the group executing the, the tasks. And if we rebuild this concept of like exposing these people on, an, on a co-op but not controlling anything about anybody, therefore you don't need those reams and reams and reams and reams of legal shit where you're putting your own, your own neck on the line for other people who you don't know, just because they've got star ratings, why should you, Sam, be responsible for what that person does in someone else's house when they're cleaning the house, right? But if you provide these platforms, that's essentially what you're doing. But if we make the whole thing completely agent-centric, where the network itself isn't actually an entity, it's just a way that people actually interact by themselves, that could be a whole different way of doing this gig economy. If it was fully agent centric like that, where would the platform co-op fit? Like, do you have thoughts on that? Like where, cause I, under, I guess I'm, I guess I don't quite know, but it, I'm imagining that there's like a platform co-op that's imagined to host this kind of centralized service. We kind of flip it all on its head inside out then hmm. does the platform co-op like take a cut to do development and then push that out to the local agents or something? The developers, are, the developers are people providing a service on this thing, right? It's the same thing. Okay. Just because I'm not walking the dog, I'm writing code, right? Why don't, you know, why isn't there? So again, um, it comes, comes back to this thing, right? This is literally a really good, I think it's a good project to build because it's something people can grasp, but it's a good way that we could actually start off that the first people, the first agents using this are the developers. And we are providing services of building this thing to whatever, right? So we figure out some way to reward ourselves out of this building of it that can then just as easily be applied to a dog walker as to an accountant. Because mm -hmm. if we get back to the platform co-op thing, why the hell does somebody who knows anything about platform like managing accountants, why have they got any influence over how people walk dogs? Mm. I'm kind of thinking about the, this idea of a platform co-op, let's just completely turn it inside out and it's just, it doesn't actually exist as an entity. It's just a known way of a bunch of us communicating together. You know, yeah, that's um, good. I was, I'm just going to send through, Michael, the because um, I've, I've been reading the, the DISCO uh, governance model just the other day, um, and there has been this sort of, for those familiar with the blockchain space, like there was the DAO, and then everybody kind of went, oh, that was a terrible idea to give the computers control of everything. And then <laughs> so the DAO got the DHO, which is the Decentralized Human Organization, and then that wasn't kind of human enough, so the DHO begat the DISCO, which is the distributed cooperative. Um, and there's just some some really interesting call-outs in there around federation, where they say things like scaling replicates the dynamics of colonialism, extending a worldview from the center and raising everything in its path. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, and you know, what, what Philip's describing in terms of the the financial and organizational role is kind of the other big thing that Sid and I, um, I mean, lots of people are in little sort of cells and we, we've been thinking about it a lot as well. Um, and the, the disco model has thought about it to great detail and like really over many years structured it very well. Um, and it's, 
it, for me, it fundamentally that comes down to what is the culture in this little neighborhood of community of practice that you're trying to create? And then what are the kind of commitments and norms that people abide by? And they're then very much buying into your culture and like really diving into it and saying like, you know, this is where I want to live my life and expend my efforts and do my thing. Um, so you, you kind of have to put your best foot forward, I think, and create that mutual dependence and support um, because that's also going to be like the recurring income streams and work streams and things that you all work on together that keep the cooperative running and keep all the software going and keep it all smoothly ticking along. Um, yeah. yeah, I might just pause there for a sec. Yeah, I yeah, like that I, I, sorry. Fine. I've just been like, I've been right in this space for the last two weeks, like trying to figure out how do we do this, right? And I, we, I, I think we're all still struggling with this idea of people actually being uh, autonomous and agent centric and actually looking after themselves because the, I would imagine that the culture of the Darabin dog walkers is going to be slightly different to the Sydney accountants. <laughs> so the idea of a platform with a culture kind of doesn't really extend past the, the complete context, right? right? Mm -hmm. So, and this is idea of like the way I've been building CRISPR and a bunch of other stuff I'm working on at the moment is this idea that, you as an individual can do whatever the fuck you like and I don't care. Do whatever you like with my software. It's completely not relevant to anybody except you and those you share it with. So that's the nice thing about Holochain, right? Is that you can be extremely granular about who's in what network. So just because somebody's behaving poorly, according to you, uh, in their group, that's really, uh, that's great behavior, right? So let them have their own version of Lokonomics. I don't care. Well, why would you care, right? Spin it up, run, run it your own way, you know? And then you invite people to the DHTs and you guys, and those people are agreeing that this is how we're going to behave. And if somebody in that group wants to do their own thing, cool. Spin up your own DHT of Lokonomics, all the bits and pieces, and do your own thing. That way... Nobody's actually responsible for anybody else's behaviour. No, totally, I, I agree. It's like free association, basically, one of the anarchist principles. I've been reading a bit of um, Proudhon recently, so um, he's very much focused on, it's almost like a version of corporatism within anarchism, so it's, um, yeah. it matches. I was also interested in what you are talking about, about almost bootstrapping the, the, the project. So. You know, we you work on it as a web developer, and somehow that's incorporated into some payment fees later on, or something like that. But also mm -hmm. using the platform to um, to encourage, like one of the things that potentially could happen would be for um, to get grants. I don't know how um, Holochain works with getting grants. Was it all through the the um, selling off the block the the um, you know, when they did the, the ICO initial coin offering, was it all that, or did they have, um, did they apply for grants? And and so one of the things that um, a not for profit can do is apply for grants. So maybe you can get uh, grant writers on board as members of the platform as well, and then you get people that can market it because obviously it's a two sided marketplace. So you need people that are going to use it as service providers and you need people that are going to use it as clients. So you kind of need to get both people on board at the same time. Um, and if it is a way of bootstrapping it so you can um, get the marketing people on board and the web developers on board and the, um, and the, whoever else is needed to, to get things running, then that would be pretty amazing. That's, that's the dream. I think, I don't know how hard it would be to get there, but um, yeah. Just about that, also, Posby, about your um, the, the governance model for Disco. Eleanor Ostrom is also very, uh, um, well, she's not alive anymore, unfortunately, but um, she did a lot about um, cooperative governance of the commons. So the environment um, is one example. Um, 
and how to, you know, how, why we've failed in the first place to govern our environment and what other methods there are. So uh, I don't know, I, I was trying to look for a link just now, but I couldn't find it. But basically, uh, she's, I think that is where the disco co-op stuff comes from, is Eleanor Ostrom's uh, yeah. Yeah. governance of the you can definitely see the influence in there. There's, you know, a section on graduated sanctions and all that kind of thing. Yeah, you seem to know more about it than I do. I started reading it and just got through the first few pages, which is pretty much an introduction, and then just went, oh my God, too much for me. I was just thinking about the other thing. Like this organizational okay. entity. It's usually for finance and tax purposes, right? So yeah. um, your average dog walker isn't able to set up a credit card transaction system usually by themselves, unless people find Square, but you know. Um, so usually what happens is that the platform co-op provides these like transaction services and then they, you know, they take a cut for their service, right? Which means that now you are financially responsible for whatever that service was. So there's now legal ramifications for whoever processed the transaction to be in some way responsible for the actions, right? So you're open to being sued and you have to have these pages and pages and pages of, you know, don't touch us. Yeah. With Holochain, you've got peer-to-peer -peer payment. So if Sam wants his dog walked and other Sam comes and walks his dog and you guys just pay each other, there's no central, there's no co-op involvement there, right? There's no, other legal, there's no other legal entity apart from Sam and Sam who transacted Holo between each other. So there's mm. no, other, no other entity now that is somehow yeah. responsible financially or can be... You know, litigation, all this kind of stuff. You basically. I'd be, I think I'd be that's interested to test the theory too, actually, because I, sorry, uh, I was going to talk about some European context I could bring to that, but see if you've got something else. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly, like, I think that intersects with Michael's question of, well, why is there an entity? And I think this is what Bosby and I have been chatting about neighborhoods, like in an agent centric world, what is that point of centralization? And I think that exists because you want to specify some kind of culture. So if, you know, think of this as a market square or a bazaar where people congregate to exchange their services or goods, the role of that marketplace isn't so much like monetary, but well, how, how are people discovering each other? What's considered douchey behavior that should not be, you know, should be excluded from this from this collective what are the kind of behaviors that should be amplified so if you're you know you go out of your way you look out for people in the community like maybe you want to amplify that so i think in an agent centric world like it's more about well what is that culture you're specifically articulating so i think the role of economics would move to this is the behavior like this is the behavior curve that we want in our collective and it need not be just like it could be good behavior bad behavior like and across, like, this is articulated specifically for dog walkers, accountants. And I think that's what Lokonomics eventually moves uh, to, like, its discovery and, and culture. Um, and which is why I think, like, neighborhoods becomes the organizing principle for some of this and not necessarily apps. But, yeah, that's... So at the moment... You a point? Sorry. When you... I... Yeah, I just, I wanted to touch on some of the learnings from a group called Freedom Co-op who was using Sensorica's system um, within their federation to manage internal counting and they had Faircoin as the blockchain too, so they, they didn't have fiat payments and stuff. Um, but the law tends to be quite nuanced and also quite specific about these kinds of things and it's the one thing that's kind of critical is if you're setting up an organization like this, you're going to need to register an entity at some point to protect yourself legally, if nothing else. Like, you don't want to be, you know, if you don't limit liability and something goes wrong, which, let's face it, we're on the cutting edge, things will go wrong, then, you know, you lose your house and all the rest of your things because your company that you're experimenting with went wrong. So you don't want that. Um, but the other thing that's really interesting about it is, like, you know, there's a pragmatism in it. Um, and it sort of allows you to work within the current system and engage with normal people that aren't on the fringe and all this weird tech. Um, but uh, so when you um, 
sorry, it's hard to find the right words at the moment. Um, when you're in an open value network and everybody is all trading and independent and you know things are crossing network boundaries and things, you have to ask the question, how is the tax department going to see what you're doing? Um, and the way it ended up working in Europe was basically, it really just depends on the VAT number you're using, or in Australia it would be the tax file number, or in America it would be whatever, social security number maybe, I don't know. Um, so Freedom Co-op, they just had a VAT number that the cooperative managed that was attached to all their legal structures that anybody who registered to be part of the collective could use, which means that from the outside of that membrane, you're all the same organisation, which then means that any transactions or things you do with other people who are also in the collective are tax-free. They're just you know internal accounting operations of, a, of an organisation. <laughs> Whereas if you are two separate entities and you're talking across a membrane and you're trading stuff, I think in Australia, even if it's non-monetary, if I'm exchanging in a barter-like situation, I still have to work out the financial value and pay tax on that if it's two separate organisations. So, um, yeah, there's some interesting kind of hacks you can do just by creating groups and allowing people to join them fairly freely where you can avoid a lot of the, the regulatory red tape and tax stuff, which is cool. Yeah, I hadn't even thought about that. Thanks, Bosby. That's really interesting. I've thought about... So, at the moment, one of the... So great. So at the moment, one of the questions is, uh, how do we register as a worker co-op or as a service pro provider co-op? And the two differences basically are, are the members sole traders or are they employed by the co-op? But obviously that's a different question so to what- Does employed mean co -op? like, yeah, does employed mean superannuation and- sick All of that, yeah. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. Which, from a political point of view, is everyone we talk to, that's kind of everyone in the co op world and the union world, that's the first question they, that comes that they ask is like, are you a, uh, a worker co op? Because obviously there's political ramifications with that, with, you know, worker co ops are much more kind of like seen as where we, or from a left kind of point of view where you want to be going whereas the the provider co-op it's still it's still exploitative potentially if you're just saying you're you need an abn and we can charge you what you want whatever you know you're basically on your own with your abn even if you're a member of this co-op if there's further stuff on like where culture impacts the organizational layer of these things. I'm curious to, to finish that thread, but I've also got some thoughts on where the data is impacted by the culture, um, if we want to move into that. But yeah, I'll just, I'll leave that one for a moment. Greg, no, yeah. point? Or was it Michael? Go for it. Go for it. Oh, wait, so you said the culture, like how the culture would be promoted by the co-op entity? Uh, yeah, I guess so. I mean, as part of it, just I think it feels like we're talking kind of on an organizational, like governance financial level at the moment about all the cultural impacts of federated marketplaces and things. And I just wanted to make sure we finished our curiosity on that first. Hmm. I guess, yeah, I don't know quite if it's fit in, but I guess with all the gig stuff, like one thing that I think of is like addressing precarity and like how to avoid kind of creating the next, um, what's it called, task rabbit. Like if, if this grows, does it just have the same like bidding down, race to the bottom, kind of race to the lowest wages competition kind of vibe? Um, and I wonder, to me, like the agent-centric neighborhood thing kind of addresses that perhaps where you, instead of like anonymous people all competing, you know, in this fight, um, it's kind of like people who you know, who you have context with, who are in your community. Um, and I wonder, yeah, how, yeah, maybe this culture thing of like, the platform kind of encouraging that or somehow trying to inculcate that in the organizations and the communities. Um, yeah, I don't know. 
mm. not a fully baked thought. <laughs> I think it, it's it's such it's such a critical component that I feel like everything else hinges on, but it's so difficult to articulate. Um, I think disco the disco model does a pretty good job of it because the the specificity to which they articulate. Um, like they, they put all these relationship metaphors in it. So it's like you come along and you can just be a commit, a, an uncommitted contributor. But then if you want to be committed, it's like you're now in the dating phase and there's this nine month period where you're going to be quite intensely mentored and make sure that, you know, you're really engaged and people are supporting you and you're supporting other people. Um, and they really, uh, because of the, the underpinnings in feminist economics, they place a lot of importance and really stress the care work factor, which... Um, you know, care work is not just care for each other, but care for the organization. So it's things like doing administrative work and, and things like that. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess as someone attempting to create these kinds of collaborative little neighborhoods and pockets, it's like the question is, how do you intend to deeply integrate newcomers into your group and make them feel supported and give that, just to create that space, really? Um, and so it's, you know, it's something I think that kind of needs to be done in quite small batches initially because it's just much easier to build that kind of familiarity with people in small groups than it is once you've got dozens or hundreds. But yeah, it'll be interesting seeing if and how the software can help us to scale that capacity as we start creating more reputational glue from those hopefully positive interactions to take into future engagements. Yeah, so... so uh... Another point on to answer your question, Michael, would be that um, how the platform works, like how the user interface works, really impacts whether it's going to be extractive or not. So uh, when I was doing the demo, I was talking about how um, low economics is really just, you know, allows members to promote their profile almost, as well as being found, um, and not to have like a you know, these are the jobs and you must bid on these jobs. Because that's, that's obviously very extractive. Um, I was also thinking about how, you know, is this an all or nothing bang, you know, that you can either go, if you want to go to Holochain, is there parts of low economics that we can extract separately, like the reputation system? And so build that in Holochain, expose it by or the REA stuff and then expose it via APIs that, that, that I could swap out into the current low economics platform? Or does it have to be, you know, we're going to go all, all or nothing, build it in one go? What are your thoughts about that? I think you'll go way in thoughts, but yeah, okay. go for it. I was just thinking we could do it piece by piece because um, if we just make each of those like entities into a D, into a DNA, and I've been using UUIDs to locate stuff so that I can um, upgrade my DHD without worrying about links and stuff like that. Um, seems to work fine. So maybe we could do that. So you could have like, maybe like a service provider list or whatever fits with um, REA stuff, I think. Because it just reeks of rebuilding this on REA. I don't know. Mm. Which would be a good way then we can um, enjoy breaking Sam's code. I'm good at that without any of my, anyone else's help. <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of takes us into REA territory. Um, from what I've seen of REA, it it kind of is like the the backbone of how these transactions work. So we could take the part of local economics that where the where you actually go, okay, this is what I want to do. And then the person gets the request and then they go, yes, approved, cancel. So is that kind of like the REA part? Uh, yeah. Um, you, you'd be in touch with, uh, or at least aware of the Beehive team, right? I was going to mention them. They, they, they're really interested yeah. in Holochain as well. Yeah, and they're actually running through building a prototype at the moment. Uh, I think it's just a Mongo backend, but the long-term vision is to swap that out with Holochain. Mm -hmm. um, they're doing all the geolocation stuff too that you look at. Cool. 
Um, so there's, yeah, there's, there's Beehive and we've talked about Hilo a fair bit on this call and there's this white label offers and needs marketplace that I started throwing together as a Hilo REA demo to fill gaps between Basin and Shiro and Seedshare and all that kind of stuff. Um, and like, honestly, like, does anybody on the call think that there are any fundamental differences between any of those platforms? Like, aside from the superficial way that the information is present, presented, there's, they're all marketplaces, right? They're all places yeah. where you put listings and they're met. Um, well, yeah, so, Beehive is about creating communities around particular, like, subjects and stuff. So that, that would fit perfectly, wouldn't it? Yeah, sure. It's, it's very <laughs> much a subset of what Beehive are doing. they got lots of things going on around it. But... Um, yeah. Yeah, um, so sort of to get to where where the culture impacts the data and it's it's in the, when you were showing all those kind of initial screens of the, the categories of listings in Loconomics, like that designing that taxonomy of what are the things that are the types of resources effectively, in this case, they're still resources, but they're still resources in REA terms. Um, yeah, what designing the answering the question of what are all the things that go on the marketplace is usually the first question, or not necessarily the marketplace, but in the network, um, is usually the first question that we ask people integrating REA as consultants is to like figure out the types of things. And then once the next question is usually what are the organizations and roles and people involved, but those are kind of like the two config steps. Um, so even with what we have at the moment and the modules we have putting Loconomics on Holo REA, at least from a backend perspective, is really just a case of populating data for all of the resource specifications for all of those taxonomies that you have in Loconomics. Um, and then it's also interesting what, where the agent centricity starts to poke around at the edges of that is when you've got those inputs where you're creating, you know, being amazing as a new category and someone has to approve it. So then in hollow chain like who's approving it and what what is that set of authority design like and is it just a moderator group that's some people who are maybe on the board of Loconomics who are managing the network and deciding what types of listings everybody gets to use or is there a different group in a different co-op making a different set of decisions somewhere else um, and then we've spoken about it before on some earlier calls that leads you very quickly into the arena of like okay well I want to interact with three different neighborhoods that all overlap slightly geographically. So I want to be a part of all of those and I want to be able to search all the listings together. Um, and in that I also, as my own individual agent, want to be able to make some equivalences about the types of listings in terms of all those categories that it's in one network versus the other. And, you know, if I'm searching for this particular thing, what's it going to find me here versus here? Um, so yeah, it's, it all, and you know, then, then from there you might decide to build modules where you can actually take those configurations and put them out into the network and share them with others. So it's like, you know, okay, everybody who's in Fitzroy and Northgate and, and um, Brunswick, just to pull random Melbourne suburbs out of my head, um, might want to have all these equivalences set up so that they can transact across those networks easily. Um, yeah, so... I guess the the short version is Loconomics feels to me very much like another marketplace, like the one we just started building um, along with Basin. Uh, yeah, and I'm I'm just trying to run through all the things you showed us, and there's not a lot in there. Maybe some of the timing stuff would need to be handled in a bit of an interesting way, but I think it would still be workable without extensions to REA. So. Um, one yeah. of the questions I had was around large data sets. Mm -hmm. um, I remember talking to Sid about this a while back. Um, so, if you look, for example, one of the largest data sets is what jobs, but one of the other ones is postcodes. So, Australia's got 10,000 in the tens of thousands of postcodes. Mm -hmm. So, how, where does, where does that data sit? You know, do I need to call a third party service to get my, to validate or Google or Google maps or whatever? Uh, I think this is where we start talking about what is considered like globally useful shared infrastructure. Um, and for something like that, I mean, if you've done it before, you know that there's, you just go to the Australia post website and there's a CSV file you download that has all those postcodes and details in it. 
So, and they only update it every couple of years or something. So, okay, you just need someone to take the initiative to go and grab that spreadsheet and dump it into a holochain network. And then that becomes the postcodes, the Australian postcodes holochain DNA that anybody who needs Australian postcodes can use and you stick it on the app store. Um, and you get basically free redundancy for that because it, because you've built it as a as its own separate module, it means that there's um, what's the word I'm looking for uh, like an implicit incentive for anybody else to use it. They don't need any other incentive because it's just useful. So uh, then, not just Locanomics, but all the users who are using other things that require postcodes are also helping you to distribute that load and make it serve faster and stuff. Um, yeah, and, and those things too can be quite like in those in those categories to do those in the same way, I think is quite useful and powerful potentially, but it's a slower conversation of like, who are we industry groups, you have to get into the room to make the decision and have the conversation and how much group think can you be bothered sitting through and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it then allows you to do less of the bridging and having to figure out what equivalences there are in overlapping networks if you've taken the initiative to go out first and say this is the set of um, you know skill types that we're going to offer on all of the Australian cooperative databases then everybody's using the same taxonomy and it all just works so um, well if you go to the um, uh, government websites they do have these lists of different job types right for uh, yeah yeah and like, but they don't like, mean much these days. <laughs> no, I was going to say like, you just how many times have you just had to tick the box that says like information communication and technology, which kind of yeah, sounds like exactly. telecom, which is nothing like what we do. Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, and that, and that goes to like which which union union am I in? You know, it's so it's yeah. so random because it's the way it's been built up over the years, I guess, and mm. they haven't upgraded it properly for you know, mm. IT stuff, which is pretty poor because it's been going on for the last 30, 40 years. Anyway. I think so, I think yeah, the, so, so the list already exists, but do we want to create, Sorry. are we going to create yeah. new ones? Is that what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, like maybe the governance list is a bit shit and we don't use it, but who's got the better list? And for me, it's sort of a question of, who are the big brand names and institutional players that people already trust? Like if you went to the services union and got them to give you the list of all of the types of unions, that would probably be like, it would hold some weight and other people would jump on board and adopt it. Versus if you're the tiny startup saying like, this is what I think all the types of jobs in the world are, then you're fighting an uphill battle to get people to care and see you as an authority. Um, Can I, um, I guess we can start wrapping up and start tying this down to anything tangible we'd like to take forward. I would just say, um, I think, Sam, there's also this element of all of these people on your platform for them to get, uh, for them to be speaking REA and, you know, the standard reputation language outside of Locanomics would also be really cool. Um, so if that, you know, yoga teacher, massage therapist is using REA for their personal business, then I think you get so much more richness of data, right? Like you could start activating credit to members. You could start activating more nuanced reputation-based engagement, all kinds of things. Um, so I think that's more the challenge, like not like thinking of REA only in your platform, but yeah, maybe even for them to use REA yeah. modules for their practice. Yeah, that is one of the huge benefits of the whole mm. IT of REA is that it allows all the flow to mm. use the word that gets pushed around. Yeah. The flow between all the different systems is now give, giving benefit to, to everyone mm. rather than everyone just trying to hold on to their own mm. data and information. Yeah, which is a harder problem, but it's also not in some cases, like if you think about it more, it's just the language that people have to speak um, in order to participate. Yeah. yeah. The, um, the easy immediate use case there is like, if you decided to manage your own finances in your own little private REA network that just tracks all of your expenses, then it's pretty easy to plug that into the low economics marketplace and 
have all of the interaction you do on the Loconomics platform automatically do your tax for you. Mm. That's, that's pretty straightforward if you're just connecting those two networks. Mm. Or like from my, like I look at it as credit, right? Like if I know you've got significant like commercial transactions, like you're a good, you're a popular practitioner, like for Loconomics to give you credit is so much easier because, you know, Loconomics knows that somebody has the capacity to pay it back. Like those are just simple things to activate that. But if like, if you, if they're not on REA, then you're just, you have to generate that within your platform. Um, it's just more, more administrative overhead and more data entry. If you're not and I think more siloization, right? Like today, mm -hmm. Uber and Grab have activated credit for their drivers, but that just means that there's an incentive for them to stay on that platform. They can't leave that platform because it's just like, it's completely, like it's completely walled them in now because their financial well-being is also linked to it. Um, yeah, how do you want to wrap this up? Where do we think we want to go with this? Well, I would love to have a crack at maybe integrating some of this stuff with REA, but I don't, I don't think my knowledge of REA is anywhere near good enough to be able to do that. Um, so maybe, maybe I could share with some kind of like flow, so a flow of like how the how a users use the system, and then and then go from there, and then we yeah, can kind of sort yeah. of like start dividing up. Oh, this is this, and this is this, and then I'll get a better understanding of REA. Yeah, that'd be really useful for me too, just to have some user requirements of a high level. This is what I want people to be able to do, and then I can map that onto mm -hmm. the marketplace app I'm building and make sure that. It includes the simple path as well as the full kitchen sink kind of deal. Yeah. Do we also want to use CRISPR? Like, I think it'd be fun to use CRISPR for some, some binding, to and seeing that we might actually have a workable version. Huh? Yeah. Actually, I was just thinking then because we've got this new RSM version, which is mostly the same like the, the, the but things work a bit differently now in in the new version like it's not just entries you get headers and all this there's just a few fundamental changes that should make development easier maybe what we do is pick, like we were talking about this a couple of weeks ago sam of picking like one of the modules of rea that would help out sam in the loponomics mm -hmm. project to start from scratch and i think that you know, the three or four of us together, we could make something really cool there and like just make a build CRISPR to be able to create this particular type of module and then use that because what it, CRISPR, I've changed it a bit in that it's this now, what I want to do is you build something in CRISPR and when you push the, the button, it creates a hollow hosting package that gets, um, what, what's going to happen is on the, and what's coming up is there will be this ability to publish whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> I'm swearing again. Um, and, but then for it to be like available on the, the app store, it has to go through like a peer review process. So people are not restricted in what they do with hollow chain, but we're going to control, or not, we're going to provide like a, a gate to what gets published for, you know, Joe Blow to be able to install stuff on his hollow instance. <clears throat> and that would give us a nice little um, like a full, like a, what call, a slice to go, right, let's produce this mm. service person, you know, kind of module, um, do the whole process. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that there's a couple of modules we could choose from. Like one of them is just, fulfillment of commitment or expressing um, interest. Like there's a bunch of things depending on where, how Sam wants to roll with us. Yes, so maybe we start with me mapping out some of the flows, like a simple flow for a user and a, and a service provider. Yeah. And then we look at how that maps to REA and then we pick a bit that would work with uh, CRISPR that would make, you know, something that's simple enough that can sit on its own that's not going to involve 
having to reinvent our wheel. Cool. All right. I don't want to take up too much people's time. So, <laughs> but I, yeah, before we go, I'd just like to say thanks to everyone for your input in today. It's been really interesting and, and uh, yeah, helpful for me getting, yeah. Yeah, getting everyone's input. Very cool. Thanks, Sam. Thanks for presenting and thanks to everyone who joined and uh, look forward to chatting next week. Maybe we continue with Lokonomics next week or we could pick up something new. Someone has ideas, let me know. I would like us to not use Zoom next week and use Jitsi. <laughs> so Ooh, I've used, I like it. Are we, I've, I've, I've used Jitsi and at the end of it, I was just like, it's not worth the benefits. Because there's just so much more lag, there's so much more like freeze frames. That was my experience. I don't know what others. Oh, you, you used, yeah, you used the free infrastructure, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Host yeah. your own. Host your own Jitsi server. Oh. We, just a Java we have, yeah. Well, if you. Sorry. If you want to put one in for years. Sorry, say that again. I think we have to host our own. We need to set it up. Yeah. But we could set it up on Holochain, can we? Um, um, I'm actually going to have a chat to Tech Services now about that because um, yeah, a friend of mine's been using it uh, quite extensively, uh, and it's because you can set up your own servers. They they've, they've got multiple, so depending on the group, you know, because I, I keep looking at it thinking, oh man, it just fits perfectly, doesn't it, with Holochain? Like you can now go mm. so to host a meeting. So I use my Holoport to host a Jitsi instance. <clears throat> do we want to try it? Yeah, I guess we could try it. Let's do it and see we'll how it goes. We'll have to next week and I'm going to uh, work with Gregory on the term. Cool. Yeah, just an idea. Nice. All the opens. Mm. All done in load and stuff. It's cool. All right. I'll uh, catch you guys soon. All right. Thank you guys. Yeah. See you next week.